I want to invite you this morning to turn with me in our time together to the book of 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'm just going to read two verses for you this morning, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 10 and 11, whether you have a paper copy of God's Word, whether you have an electronic copy of God's Word, when you get there, just shout amen. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse number 10, Hear these words as recorded in Holy Scripture. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as if though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping or serving others? Then do it with all the strength all the energy that God supplies, then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ because all the glory and all the power belong to him forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these golden moments you've given us to gather together. And already we sense your power and your presence permeating in this room. And now, Lord, as we study together your word, Lord, would you allow your word to convict us and allow your word to transform us? Lord, as always, I pray that your name will be glorified, that your people would be edified, that sinners would be evangelized, and most of all, that Satan would be absolutely horrified. Lord, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, let those be acceptable in your sight because, Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. Lord, let us leave this place today more in love with Jesus at the end than at the beginning. We ask this in the strong, powerful name of our soon returning King Jesus. We all said together, amen. I want to tag this text briefly with this thought in mind. I want to preach about living a life that brings glory to God. Living a life that brings glory to God. I'm convinced today that the church is designed to be a place where believers walk together in love and unity. We walk together in unity that we can accomplish so much more for the glory of God. That the Bible teaches us in Amos chapter 3, verse number 3, how can two walk together except they agree? I believe that the church exists to bring glory to God. The early church, they made a difference because they were unified around the right priorities. They focused on keeping the main thing the main thing. They were not competitors, but rather they were colleagues working together for one common cause. They were not divided over worship styles. They were not divided over preferences. They were not divided over generations, but rather... They were committed to living out the great commandment, and they were committed to fulfilling the great commission. In fact, the Bible gives us commentary on to what the early church was committed and devoted to. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 42, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to four things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' preaching and teaching, that every time they gathered together, whether it was in large group or small group, they prioritized the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. They prioritized fellowship. The very first time I read that phrase, fellowship, the first thing that came to mind was fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, green beans, and banana pudding. <laughs> but the word in the original language is the word koinonia, that they actually enjoyed being together. And one of the signs of a healthy New Testament community is that the people who are a part of that community, they actually enjoy spending time together. They devoted themselves to breaking of bread. And that breaking of bread simply meant that every time they gathered together, they were reminded of the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made on that old rugged cross by allowing his body to be bruised and beaten. And they remembered the blood of Jesus that was shed to remind us that without the shedding of blood, that there would be no remission of sin. Every time they gathered together, they remembered the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that early church, they devoted themselves to prayer, that they made sure that prayer was the foundation of their gathering. One of the signs of a vibrant, healthy believer is that a vibrant, healthy believer prioritizes their biblical values. You see, brothers and sisters, we live in a culture 
that devalues values. We live in a culture where anything goes and everything is acceptable. But Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, that you are a chosen generation, that you and I are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who has brought us out of the darkness into the marvelous light. This message teaches us this morning that you and I are never more like Jesus than when we are serving one another. 1 Peter chapter 4 is written by the Apostle Peter. This is the Peter that preached on the day of Pentecost, and your Bible and my Bible tells me that at least 3,000 people were added to the church on that day. But this is also the same Peter that when life got stressful and when the pressure mounted, he denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. The Apostle Peter, he writes this message to believers who were enduring great persecution and suffering. He writes this epistle as a word of warning and also as a word of encouragement. And in verse number 7 of 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says, The end of all things is near, that Jesus was coming back. And Peter knew that the next major event on God's calendar was the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says to the people of God, Get ready because Jesus is coming. And in these verses this morning, we learn the values and the behaviors that are put on display by Great Commission believers. And so the question for us this morning is simply this. How do we bring glory to God? How do our lives display and demonstrate what it means to bring glory to God? Well, Peter tells us that in these verses. The first thing that you and I need to do is if our lives are going to bring glory to God, Peter says to us in verse number 7, he says to us, we need to pray believingly. Listen to what Peter says. He says in verse 7, he says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and be sober-minded in order that you may pray. Peter says to us, you cannot be sleepy-headed. You cannot be soggy, but rather you and I are called to be alert and be of sober mind. Why? In order that you may pray. The early church's ministries and efforts were always marked by prayer. So Peter says, be alert and be sober-minded so that you may pray. Peter encourages the believers to engage in prayer. And when you and I pray believingly, we should pray expectantly. You remember the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus doesn't say, if you pray. But Jesus says, when you pray, go into your secret closet and close the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret, he will reward you openly. When you pray believingly, you pray expectantly. Jesus reminds us in Mark chapter 11, Jesus says, I tell you, whatever you ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I'm reminded of Jesus teaching on the Mount of Beatitudes, and Jesus teaches that famous lesson in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find, and not, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, they will find. And the one that dots the door will be open unto them. Peter reminds us if our lives are going to bring glory to God, we've got to pray believingly. And when you pray believingly, you pray expectantly. But not only do you pray expectantly, you also pray earnestly. Jesus models this to us in Mark chapter 1, verse number 35. Jesus gets up early in the morning. Jesus goes to a solitary place, and there Jesus prays. Oh, brothers and sisters, if prayer is not the foundation of your life, the foundation will fall apart. And if prayer is not your main business, you'll soon be out of business. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray expectantly. We need to pray, brothers and sisters, eagerly, but we also need to pray earnestly. Never shall I forget the story about the fox and the rabbit. 
The fox ran after the rabbit, but the fox was never able to catch the rabbit. And the fox was never able to catch the rabbit because the fox was running for food, but the rabbit was running for its life. And if you want something that you've never had before, you've got to be willing to do some things you've never done before. Oh, listen, if we're going to see a public movement from God, then we must have those private moments with God. If you depend on the organization, you'll get what the organization can give you. If you depend on your education, and we need every bit of education that we can get, but if you depend on your education, you'll get what your education can give you. If you depend on your money, you'll get what money can give you. But if you depend on prayer, you'll get what only God can do. And that's what we need. We need what only God can do. I'm simply trying to tell you this this morning, that God can do more in a moment than you and I can do in a lifetime. And so Peter simply says to us, first of all, if our lives are going to bring glory to God, he says we're called to pray believingly. But notice what else Peter says to us in verse number 8. He says we're called to love unconditionally. Listen to these words that Peter gives us. Above all, love each other deeply. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. You know this verse. We know this verse every time we mess up. We quote this verse, but we only quote the big clause of this verse. You ought to forgive me because the Bible said, love covers a multitude of sin. But notice what Peter says. He says, above all, love each other deeply. This phrase, above all, speaks to the priority and the premium that we should put on loving other people. There are so many things that as believers we're called to do, but Peter seems to suggest to us that at the top of the list, that at a priority as a premium, loving other people ought to be a priority in our lives. Above all, love each other. And he uses this phrase deeply. He does not suggest to us that we should love each other with a shallow love, but we are called to love each other deeply. In fact, this is not the first time that Peter uses that phrase deeply. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 22, Peter says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. This seems to mirror the word of Jesus in John chapter 13, verse number 35, where Jesus says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And Peter says, above all, love each other deeply. This word deeply is a strenuous love, an intense love. Essentially, what Peter says is this. He says, love takes work. Um, if you are part of a family, you know that love takes work. If, if you've got a roommate, then you know that love takes work. Uh, for, for the married folk, if you've been married for two days, you know that love takes work. If you are a part of a New Testament church, you know that love takes work. And we know that love takes work because Peter says the proof of loving each other deeply is forgiveness. Listen to what Peter says. Above all, love each other deeply. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. Notice this phraseology, love covering our sins. This phraseology of our sin being covered is not new to the New Testament. You, you see this in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, we see a beautiful picture of this. Noah got drunk, shamefully uncovered himself. His son saw his shame and they did not cover him, but rather they went and told the family, and in loving care, Ham's two brothers come back and cover their father's sin and cover their father's shame. And brothers and sisters, Ham and his brothers are not the only ones that know what is it like to cover our sins. 
We, too, have a Father in heaven that saw the darkness of our sins, saw us on the way to hell, died not on a gold cross or a shiny silver cross, but died on an old rugged cross in order that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ would cover your sins and my sins. Love covers a multitude of sin. The doctrine of sin, sin means we have missed the mark. Did you know this morning that sin will take you further than you want it to go? Sin will keep you longer than you want it to stay, and sin will cost you more than you want it to pay. But the Bible is true this morning. All of us have sinned, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are hopeless and helpless. And aren't you glad this morning that God demonstrates his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for the ungodly. Did you know this morning there's nothing so good that you can do to cause God to love you anymore? And there's nothing so bad that you can do to cause God to love you any less? He just loves us as we are. And so if our lives are going to bring glory to God, we're called to pray believingly. We're called to Love unconditionally. And then verse number 9 gives us another clue. Verse number 9 says, if we're going to pray believingly, if we're going to love unconditionally, then it ought to be manifested in our lives. The third thing that Peter says to us is we ought to live hospitably. Listen to what verse number 9 says. Offer hospitality one to another without grumbling and without complaining. That one verse says to us, we ought to help people joyfully. We're called to be hospitable to those who are not just our friends, not just those who are fun to be by, but we're called to open our arms and be hospitable to everybody. Simply what Peter says to us is as believers, we are called to be kind to other people. That if Jesus opens his arms and welcomes those people, then we too are to open our arms and make others feel welcome and provide them a place of acceptance. And so Peter says, offer hospitality without grumbling, murmuring, or complaining. You know, sometimes offering hospitality can be a chore. Um, I, I live in a uh, neighborhood, and uh, in our neighborhood, we have the community trampoline. And uh, the only reason that our trampoline became the community trampoline is because our trampoline is the only trampoline that still has a net on it. All, all the other trampolines, there's, there's, there's no net, and so all the kids come to our property, and so we want to be good, hospitable Christians, and so we want to welcome all the kids on our uh, property. And my, my youngest daughter, uh, she's got the gift of hospitality. And I, I came home one day, and she's giving all the kids icicle pops, giving all the kids Gatorade. And I said, time out. I said, we're already providing the trampoline. Dr. Rogers, we're not requiring parents to sign waiver release forms, but we're taking all the risk ourselves. And I said, we're already providing the trampoline. And, and I got real spiritual. I said, seem like they, mama and daddy, can provide their own icicle pops and provide their own Gatorade. And then I went to the next level of spirituality. I said, they, mama and daddy, got stimulus checks just like we did by your own Gatorade by your own icicle pops. And then Peter speaks to me and he says, offer hospitality without grumbling and without complaining. But listen to the last thing that Peter says to us in verses 10 and 11. Our lives are going to bring glory to God. Peter says, finally, this morning, you and I are called to serve faithfully. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of gifts. Use them well to serve one another. If you have the gift of speaking, speak as if though God himself were speaking through you. If you have the gift of helping others, do it with all the strength and all the energy that God supplies. 
oh brothers and sisters this morning, you are never more like Jesus than when you are serving one another. And as you and I serve faithfully, we need to be reminded today that you are important to God. The Bible says each one has received a gift. If you are born again, you have received the gift from the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are important to God. Listen to me. If you allow other people to define who you are, you're no more than who they say that you are. But if you allow yourself to be defined by God, then you're who God says that you are. Did you know this morning that you are a child of the King? You are born again. You are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a friend of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a child of God. You are important to God. And because you are important to God, God invests his gift in you. Notice what it says. Each one has received a gift. I believe that we received at least three gifts. I believe he gives you the gift of salvation. When you come down the aisle, give your hand to the preacher and your heart to the Lord. You're redeemed from the curse of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And if the Lord Jesus Christ were to come back any time, you'll have eternity in the presence of the Lord. Then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you you are born again, you are immediately indwelled with the Holy Spirit, and now the Holy Spirit controls your life. And then thirdly, you receive a spiritual gift. You receive a spiritual gift in order that you can engage in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is calling for every born again believer to use the gifts that they've been given because we've been created in the image of God in order to be on mission with God. It was C.T. Studd that says the light that shines the farthest is the one that shines the brightest at home. Will you be willing to allow your light to shine right where you are at? And then Peter says this. He says, if anyone speaks, they should speak as if though they're speaking the very words of God. You, you've heard that phraseology, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Listen, that's a lie from the pit of hell. I know people right now who are upset by what people said 10, 20, 30 years ago, and they can't get along with one another. Words do matter. Every time we open up our mouth, we need to ask ourselves, is this speaking with the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus Christ? Every time we tweet, every time we post on Facebook, every time we post on Instagram, Snapchat, and and tip -top. We ought to ask the question, is that post bringing glory to God? Preach, really. I'm doing the best I can. But then he says, if anyone serves, you should serve with all the strength and all the energy that God supplies. Why? Because everything you do, brothers and sisters, will bring glory to God because he has all the glory. He has all the power forever and ever. Our Lord is interested in receiving his glory. That's why the Bible teaches us in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 23, that everything you do, you ought to do it as unto the Lord and not not as unto man. I simply come by to tell you this morning that when you live a life that brings glory to God, you are simply saying to God, God, your hands are bigger than my hands. I close with this. Little boy went to the candy shop. Little boy wanted to buy some candy. He says, sir, I want to buy some candy. The man said to the little boy, boy, how much money do you have? He says, well, I've got five cents. The man said to the little boy, five cents will buy you a handful of candy. Little boy put his nickel on the counter. Little boy just stood there looking at the man, and the man said, son, I told you, five cents will buy you a handful of candy. Little boy just stood there. Little boy just started looking at the man, and the man said, boy, are you deaf? dumb or slow. I told you five cents will get you a handful of candy. Little boy just stood there looking at the man. By this time, Dr. Pig, man gets upset, gets frustrated. Man takes his big old hand, goes inside the barrel, and gets a big old handful of candy. 
so much candy that when he got ready to put the candy in the hand of the little boy, the little boy's hand was so small, the little boy had to hold out both of his hands. Man put the candy in the boy's hand. Boy standing there looking and saying, ha, 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 ha. And the man says, son, what are you laughing at? He says, well, sir, you told me that five cents would get me a handful of candy. I looked at your, I looked at my little old hands and looked at your big old hands, and I determined that your hands were bigger than my hands. Brothers and sisters, that's all I come to tell you this morning, that God's hands are always bigger than our hands. Our hands were too small to be nailed to an old rugged cross, but God's hands were big enough to be nailed to the cross. They nailed my Jesus and your Jesus to an old rugged cross. They put him in a bar too. He stayed there all night Friday. He stayed there all night Saturday. But early on Sunday morning, he arose from the dead with all power in his hands. I come to tell you, there is no problem that Jesus cannot solve. There is no pain that Jesus cannot comfort. There is no door that Jesus cannot open. There is no sickness that Jesus cannot heal, and there is no sin that Jesus cannot forgive. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Living a life that brings glory to God. Would you be an instrument in the hands of God where your life displays and demonstrates what it means to bring glory to God. Every day when you wake up, look at your little old hands. Say, Lord, I want to give glory to you because your hands are always bigger than mine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this next generation of pastors and preachers, lawyers, doctors, government leaders and those who will serve in the classroom, this next generation of those who will be CEOs and those who will be administrators for colleges just like this. And Lord, even for those that will decide to start their own businesses, and even some, Lord, will decide to stay at home and raise their family. Some, Lord, will declare that they want to serve among the nations. And I pray that whatever it is you have for them, that their lives will bring glory to you. Lord, thank you for this great school. Thank you for the faculty and the staff and all that influence this next generation. And may those who gather in this place today, may their lives always result in bringing glory to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, amen. God bless you.